Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selam ala seyyidil mursalin seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem teslimen kathira. Rabbana lakal hamdu. Kama yanbagi li jalali vajhik ve li azimi sultanik. Subhanaka la nuhsi thanaan alik anta kama athnayta ala nefsik. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is Imam Zay Shakir and we're here for another session with Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali his great uh, master for work لطعف المعارف في مال مواسم العام من الوظائف the subtleties of knowledge concerning what each season of this each season of the year contains from religious duties and virtues and obligations alhamdulillah so uh, alhamdulillah we started uh, with the first section of the book dealing with some of the virtues of ramadan and then the next section dealt with uh, generosity and uh, the quran and tonight we will start two sections. One section deals with the middle of Ramadan. So now we are in the middle of Ramadan. In the Hadith of Salman al-Farisi, where many, many virtues of Ramadan are mentioned, as many scholars consider the Hadith of Salman to be weak, but the individual virtues, if you take them one by one, you'll find there's substantiating evidence that makes them sound and acceptable to work with. One of those virtues mentioned by Salman, uh, mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu in the hadith related by Salman and Farisi, or attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the following. Huwa shahrun awwalahu rahmah wa awsatuhu mawthira wa akhiruhu ibkun minan nar. So it's a month, Ramadan that is, whose beginning days are mercy and whose middle days are forgiveness and whose final days are or concluding days are deliverance or liberation from the hellfire. And Ibn Rajab al Hanbali says here in the Ta'af al Ma'arif when the hadith is mentioned, he says, Bal kulluhu rahma wa kulluhu mawfira wa kulluhu itqum min al nar. That all of it, the month, is mercy and all of it is forgiveness. forgiveness and all of it is liberation from the hellfire, whether these particular qualities dominate during these particular times. So now we're in the days of forgiveness. And so again, mercy still prevails. That the, the mercy, the gates of mercy are flung open until the end of the month. So mercy still prevails. But during these days, forgiveness dominates. And we should reflect before getting started on the many gates of gateways of forgiveness Allah Ta'ala has opened up, up for us during the month of Ramadan. For example, in Psalm Ramadan, Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Psalm Ramadan, Imanan Wahtisaban, Wufir Allahum Taqadam and Mindambi. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan with sincere faith, anticipating a reward, their prior sins are forgiven. من قام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. Whoever stands for worship during the nights of Ramadan with sincere faith, anticipating a reward, all of their prior sins are forgiven. من قام من قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم وما تأخر من ذنبه. So whoever stands for worship during the night of power with sincere faith, anticipating a reward, all of their prior sins are forgiven. فَأَمَنْ فَتَّرَ صَائِمًا فِي رَمَضَانَ فَكَانَ مَغْفِرَةً لَهُ This is also mentioned in the hadith of Salman al-Farisi. Whoever gives the fasting person something to break their fast with is a source of forgiveness for them. And, and so these are just some of the gates of forgiveness. We'll conclude by mentioning a hadith uh, re, re, related to Abi Hurairah radiallahu uh, an. The hadith scholars say, bi hukm al-marfu'ah. 
but the ruling is that it came from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it discusses matters related to forgiveness uh, <clears throat> and no Sahaba would speak of those matters without having heard them from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the hadith mentions uh, قال عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال يغفر يغفر فيه يعني في رمضان إلا من يأبه everyone in Ramadan will be forgiven except one who refuses and hearing this uh, those around him were startled وقالوا and they said فقالوا they said ومن يأبه يا أبا هريرة they said whoever refuses أبا هريرة Abu Huraira, فقال من يبا إن يستغفر الله, the one who would refuse to ask Allah for forgiveness. So, brothers and sisters, just ask Allah. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Just seek Allah's forgiveness, and that's a means for forgiveness during this month, and that's one of the great virtues of this month, the middle days of Ramadan, because. Uh, people in the middle, if you've ever run competitively track and field or anything of that sort, I used to do that uh, way back in the day. Uh, the middle part of the race, if it's a longer race, like a quarter mile, for example, is the toughest or a mile or 800 meters. It's the toughest. When you start off, you have energy. And when you're coming down the home stretch, stretch, you see the end is in sight. But when you're in the middle, people tend to, to lag a little bit. And so the middle days of Ramadan, these are the days shaitan attacks. Because, you know, now the middle and the excitement, oh, it's Ramadan, you know, and every night at Tarawi and staying till the end. And then about four or five days in, start to leave early. Then 10 or 12 days in, should I go or not? Should I go pray? I can pray here. And so shaitan starts to play with people. And so this is something that Ibn Rajab focuses on, and he ushers some verses of poetry in that regard. Uh, one of the things he emphasizes that you are obeying, you are obeying shaitan while he is your enemy and rebelling against the law while he is your friend. And Allah mentions in the Quran, the believers recognize that Allah is their friend. The believers recognize Allah is their friend. In uh, there's a verse in the Quran, in Wali Allah Huladi Nazal al Kitaba Bahuatawallah Salihim. Verily, my protecting friend is Allah, and he undertakes the affair of the of the righteous. Bahua Yatawallah Salihim. He undertakes the affair of the righteous. And so um, the wilaya, this idea of wilaya, wilaya, wali, awliya, the wilaya involves three things, brothers and sisters. This is the view of, of one scholar. You might hear other things, but these I think will be agreed upon. Al wilayatu hiya, al nusra, wal qurba, wal mahabba. So the wilaya is nusra, divine aid and help and assistance, protection. So I mentioned in the verse, I translate verily my protecting friend. Kurba, nearness. So the, the, the wilaya involves, involves nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we mention mahabba, a true friend loves you. And you love your true friends if you're true in your friendship. So, al mahabba. And so, these qualities are combined in the concept or idea of wilaya. So, may Allah bless us all to be amongst the awliya, to have sincere faith, and to be sincere in implementing Allah's orders and avoiding Allah's prohibitions. And that's the foundation of wilaya. And Allah, Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran in that regard, Allah 
لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. So verily, ألا إن أولي الله verily those who are near and beloved and helped by Allah, the awliya of Allah, there shall be no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. Al-ladheena amanu wa kanu yattaqoon. Those who believe and they possess taqwa, they possess a, a consciousness of the commandments and prohibitions of Allah, a consciousness that leads them to willingly undertake the orders and to willingly avoid the prohibitions. So one of the poets that Ibn Rajab quotes in that regard, he says, Ra'allahu man nawa wen kana ma ra'a hafidna lahu al-ahd al-qadima tabayya'a So he says that Allah has protected uh, the one we love and even if he found no worldly protector in Canada, Ra'a, we've, we preserve for him the ancient covenant, and that's the covenant of Tawheed. Am I not your Lord? They all responded in affirmation, certainly, certainly you are. And that's the ancient covenant. And he squandered it. She squandered it. Why? by deviating from Tawheed and everything that it involves. وَصَاحَبْتَ قَوْمًا كُنْتُ أَنْهَاكَ عَنْهُمُ And you kept the company of people that I warned you against a company, against their company, that I forbade you from accompanying you. وَحَقِّكَ مَا أَبْقَيْتَ لِسُلْحِ مَوْضِعَ And so your right is that you yourself have left no place for you to be at peace. And so when one deviates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and from the oneness of Allah, and from the protection of Allah, from the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll find no sanctuary in this world. Even if they're in a built-up mighty fortress. And they might not be assailed physically, but they'll be assailed psychologically and spiritually. And so you see empty souls. May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir. La ilaha illallah. Then another uh, verse, or a, couple, a couplet rather, no, a single verse, uh, mentions the remorse of one who hasn't taken advantage of the first part of Ramadan. Now we're in the middle, we're moving into the middle part. And they look at back at the first part and all they can say, you know, the masjid opened and I'm vaccinated, but I used the excuse, it's still COVID, so I didn't go and lost the opportunity of, of, of praying, listening to the Quran of the jama'ah even under social distancing and other considerations. I lost that opportunity. But towards the middle of Ramadan, my Quran stayed on the shelf and the TV remote stayed in my hand. And so many people are going to be filled with remorse. They're going to be filled with remorse. But there's time to make up for that. She so says in that regard, Yan, uh, Yan, uh, يا ندامايا سها قبل سها فاتردوا عني عن الصيدا والمرحة She said, oh my, what great regress I have. My heart is crying out, crying out. Put, uh, push away from me the childishness and gaiety. And so he, he's just, just, pleading to be free from those qualities that keep us from spiritual maturity. So Sriba, so Sibyan, Sabi, so Sriba, the childishness. And our culture encourages childishness. Uh, you know, it's shameful. It brings me to tears, literally. 
to see what's happening to our children, our adults. When I'm not a television watcher, I, I, I read Jerry Mander's book, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television in 1987, and I eliminated my television. And uh, But my mother-in-law lives with us, and sometimes I keep her company and she's watching my television. And just the, the, the childishness, the giddiness that adults be display in their behavior. And this is corrupting our children. It's corrupting adults. If an adult sees a serious child, they'll think the child is abused. Because a child, the image of child is, is the silly, frivolous, uh, immature human being. And so if you go to Mexico and you see 10 year olds and nine year olds at the stalls in the market running the show, people are taken aback. That's how it used to be here. That's how it used to be here. And so a person who is serious about their spiritual development wants to be rid of those qualities and characteristics because their heart is calling them uh, to something better. Saha al-qalbu, saha. The heart is crying out for something better. And it's searching for something. Fatradu anni, asiba wa maraha. So push the, this childing, childishness and this frivolousness and this gaiety away from me because I want to be a spiritually mature human being. May Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah give us tawfiq. And Allahumma salli rasulillah. So either that continues or it's a, a new verse. I wrote them all in a notebook so I don't have to flip through the pages. So anyway, hazam uh, al-aqlu junood al-lilhawa. The intellect has routed the forces of of caprice and whim, and and so when one just instinctively responds, and this is something shaitan exploits. This is something the nafs, the unrefined nafs, works hand in hand with the with the hawa, and a, a proof of that is the verse in. Surah Allahumma Surah Rasulillah. Naziat. So when Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَنْ نَفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى So, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ The one who fears the time they will stand before their Lord. وَنَهَنْ نَفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى and they deny their soul the things that Hawa uh, inclines it towards. And so the Wanahan Nafsa and Al Hawa. And so the Hawa and the Nafs they work together. And and so uh, but when the intellect takes over, the Hawa is suppressed. And so the poet says, Hazam al Aqlu, Julud al Hawa that the intellect has routed the forces of whim. Because now a person doesn't respond to their whims. Aren't you hungry for Burger King now? Yeah, for sure. When the intellect is involved, aren't you hungry for Burger King now? Whoa. Hey, did you read Fast Food Nation? That stuff will supersize you. You're going to have a blood pressure problem. Your arteries are going to be clogged. And those, those french fries, remember the controversy with Mickey D's? They were putting lard in the french fries and the Hindus sued them. So uh, the intellect wards off the force of the hawa. And, and so the poet is emphasizing that. So he said, Hazm al-aqlu junoon al-lil-hawa fasti wa la ta'ajibu an saluha and so uh, uh, pay attention and don't be surprised if he attains a state of peace, a sulh, or, or is reformed, salah, saluha. So our reformation 
our reformation and our peace comes through the reign of the intellect. And this is the great gift that Allah has bestowed upon us as human beings, the distinctive gift. Zajr al haqqu fu'adi far'awa wa thaq al qalbu minni wa saha. And so uh, the truth or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has pulled back my heart, has, has uh, uh, alerted my heart to danger. So the zajru uh, is to pull, pull someone back. So the Allah has pulled me back or the truth has pulled me, pulled my heart back and now it can be silent. So let it be silent. And now my heart has awoken. minni wasaha, And now it's alert. And so the alert heart is the foundation of the rule of the intellect. Because we, we understand the intellect is inseparable from the heart, even though there are certain uh, physiological functions associated with the brain. But the, the uh, operative function of the intellect is rooted in the heart. Allahumma al-musta'an. Bariru tawbata min qabli rada. So I hasten to repentance before you are ruined or before you are just decayed. Now, now you, you can't use this body as a net to harvest good because now the body is decayed. And once that happens, there's no more increase in ajr, thawab, except for those who might pray for us after our passing. A sadaqa jari, or some good we did continues to benefit people. And so the one who called him is calling us hasten. So waha and bisura hasten. And this this could be interpreted famunadihi, the one who called him. Uh, I, I would like to interpret this as the one who is called the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yunadina is calling us. Because we are on the same minhaj as the Prophet. Allah has commanded the messengers with that which He has commanded the believers. And so the one who called Him is calling us. But His response was intuitive because of the purity of His heart. Our response sometimes requires a struggle. So may Allah Ta'ala bless us. And Ramadan is, is the best time to respond. Ramadan is the best time to respond because the, the winds of divine mercy are blowing and we just need to expose ourselves to them. Expose yourselves to the gentle breezes of your Lord's mercy. So I should say breezes, because there, there's no violence. The, the, the winds, no, the breezes. The breezes of your Lord's mercy, they're blowing, and they don't blow any stronger than they do during the month of Ramadan. Expose yourself to them. Brothers and sisters, expose yourself to those breezes. Expose yourself to the gentle breezes of your Lord's mercy. Then he says, Rahimahullah. Oh, this is a, a new set of verses. Tanasafa uh, Shahru. So the middle of the month has come. And he's filled with regret and with, um, sorry, with regret and is brokenhearted. Why? Over what is past? We're at the middle of the month. I didn't. I haven't done anything yet. 
So if the heart is alive, it's going to be saddened by that reality. If it's dead, it will continue on its way. May Allah give us tawfiq. وَاخْتَصَ بِالْفَوْزِ بِالْجَنَّاتِ مَنْ قَدَمَا And the ones who are actively engaged in service, they're the ones that have been designated with the victory of Jannah. So as we mentioned earlier, Ramadan, unlimited reward. Unlimited reward for fasting. No one can take the reward of the fast. Because it's not, it's not ours, it's Allah's. Except fasting, that's mine, and I will, will reward the servant with that. And so Ramadan is an opportunity to salvation, like no other opportunity that we have. No other opportunity with the possible exception of the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And Allah gives us tawfiq in both of these times. Sharaf al-Zaman, the nobility of these very special times. Then he says, وَأَصْبَحَ الْغَافِلُ الْمِسْكِينُ مُنْكَسِرًا the, the heedless wretch is now broken, has become broken. مِثْلِي فَيَا وَيْحَهُ يَا عَظْمَ مَحُرِمَا and so the, the, the heedless wretch like myself, mythly. So the poet, and this is instructive for us, doesn't exclude himself or herself from the loss that has been occurred, that has been uh, uh, occur, uh, occurred, that has been, that accrues to one who hasn't taken advantage of this very, very special time. And he says, uh, and a uh, woe, how great is that which has been missed, that which he's been deprived of. Because these days don't come back. If we're blessed, yeah, we will see Ramadan next year, inshallah, if we're blessed. But we won't see these days again. We won't have this opportunity again. We won't have this opportunity again. And so it's, it's like a fisherman. So he's preparing it. There's a big fish, succulent fish. It looks like it could feed 10 people. And it's swimming around, swimming around. And he's fiddling around, talking on his phone when he should putting the worm on the hook and dropping the hook and the line into the water, fiddling around. He finally gets everything we prepare and the fish swims off. He drops the hook and he catches another fish. But he didn't catch that fish. He didn't get to enjoy that fish. So may Allah give us tawfiq and tashir and kabul and help us to, to really take advantage of this time. Then he continues on. Uh, so, man fatuh zar'u fi waqtil bidari fama tarahu Whoever misses the opportunity to plant during the season of planting, you will not see him or her harvest anything except, except grief and regret and remorse. And so again, if, if these are the, this is the time we plant the seeds. We, and we plant them with our prayer, we plant them with our Qur'an, we plant them with our dhikr, our rad, afkar, during this month. This is the time to plant those seeds at the beginning of the month. And then when the end of the month comes, then we reap the harvest. We reap the harvest. I need to just focus up, focus itself. Sorry about that. Uh, we didn't get the autofocus yet. Uh, but we're going to get it, inshallah. Right. So, Allahumma uh, Rasulillah. Then he goes on to say, so you don't see the one who fell, the one who fell to plant the seeds of righteousness during the beginning of Ramadan and this middle part of Ramadan will not harvest anything at the end of the month except grief and remorse or regret. So, you don't want to be brothers and sisters, one who looks back over the end, at the end of the month and sees Nothing but squandered opportunities. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to not squander this opportunity. And then he concludes, 
توبى لمن كانت التقوى بضاعته في شهره وبحبل الله معتصما. So paradise, توبى is uh, described as the earth or a tree in paradise. So no matter what interpretation you're in, if you have توبى, you're in توبى. So we could just say paradise for the one who taqwa is his trade goods. So he's trading in piety and righteousness. He's trading in piety and righteousness. Tuba liman kana kana taqwa bi da'atahu fi shahri wa bi hablillah mu'tasima. During his month, meaning Ramadan, and the rope of Allah is what he's clinging to. And uh, this is a this is a beautiful allegory in the Quran. Because what is the rope of Allah? Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Shahr Ramadan illadi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Allah during which the Quran was revealed. Wa'tasimu bi hablillah jami'an wa la tafarraqu. Hold fast to the rope of Allah and be not, not divided. What does the mufassirin based on an interpretation of Imam Ali radiallahu anhu karram Allah wajah the rope of Allah is the Quran the rope of Allah is the Quran Habdullah al-Mateen al-Quran al-Kareem the rope of Allah is the Quran so in Ramadan we're holding on to the rope of the Quran and it's pulling us to safety and to security la ilaha illallah then he uh comes to a section, it's not the final section, but the section is described as the end of the month of Ramadan. And so the next two sessions we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, we'll start though, we'll start with this and then we'll take any questions or comments we might have. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu during the 10 days of Ramadan, he would get very serious. And amongst the things he would do is he would avoid contact with his wives and he would awaken them for prayer. So he would call out in the chambers, as-salat, as-salata, prayer, prayer, and awaken them to pray. And then he would recite, would recite the verse from the Quran, وَأَمْرَهَلَكَ بَصَالَةِ وَاسْتَغْيُرْ عَلَيْهَا so awaken your family for prayer and be patient and so or be patient in your prayer. And so we, we should awaken family members during this blessed time. Awaken our spouses. We should get up by head. We should stand in our sleep. And we'll introduce the 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 set of 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 Verses that are the focus of this next section by reminding you this way, brothers and sisters. Most of the, many of the verses, if not most, they focus on how when we're not sleeping, that we're given energy because of the strength of our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same goes from where, when we're not uh, eating when we're not fasting, when we're not eating, rather during the fast, the Prophet sallam, he will connect his fast, and we saw it for siyan, and he 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 prevented us from it. Not to don't fast continuously, like four or five days not eating uh, or drinking anything, no no iftar, and they would say, but you fast continuously, O Messenger of Allah. And he would say, I'm not like you. My Lord feeds and gives me drink. And as we'll see next week, the dominant interpretation of that is not physical food and physical drink but a spiritual food and spiritual drink that's so invigorating, it relieves the body of the need for physical nourishment. 
And, and so this is, and there are the evidences that this is the sound and correct interpretation of his saying, my Lord feeds me and provides me with drink during this period of continuous fasting. You're not like me. In other words, your heart is not like my heart. So in the, in the hadith of uh, one hadith Qudsi of related by Abi Dhar and the Prophet Sallallahu from his Lord, وَلَوْ كَانَ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَأَخْيَرَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ وَإِنْسَكُمْ كَانُوا عَلَىٰ أَتْقَىٰ قَلْبِ الرَّجْلٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنْكُمْ مَا زَادَ ذَلِكَ فِي مُلْكِي شَيْئًا if the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you were as righteous as the most righteous heart amongst you, that would not increase my dominion in any way. And some say, أَتْقَى قَلْبِ رَجُلٍ مِنْكُمْ is the Prophet Sallallahu Others say, be, are they over and besides the Prophet Sallallahu And this is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. But... If we look at all of humanity, it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so his heart is the most receptive to the divine messages. And in that sense, he's not like us. And that receptivity opens the pathway for a great a source of energy and strength beyond this physical realm that no one of us possesses. So may, may we have Tawfiq and Taysir and Kabul. And we'll examine this subject deeply, uh, more deeper, uh, next week in the context of the poetry Ibn Rajab brings, describing the end of Ramadan and then farewell to Ramadan. So may Allah give us tawfiq. So there's a question here, Jonah asks, do you have any suggestion for someone who was raised Christian is considering reverting to Islam? Sounds like a whole lot of people I know. That sounds like myself. Uh, my suggestion is uh, show them a good example and uh, just show them a good example and a good book. I, if, if they're more intellectually, and if they're just a, a common but educated person, uh, I would suggest Islam and Focus. It's readily available on the internet by Hamouda Abdul Ati. It's very uh, comprehensive. That that book got me into Islam. So I read that book. I was searching, searching, searching. Then I got a copy of Islam in Focus by Hamouda Abdul Ati, Rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on him. He's passed on. And that was it. I said, this is it. This is what I've been searching for. There's another book if someone's a little more intellectually inclined, say like a college student who likes to read and study, is Introduction to Islam by Muhammad Hamidullah. Muhammad Hamidullah was the imam of the Paris Masjid uh, for a long time uh, back in the day. And, and his book, Introduction to Islam, it's a little more intellectual, but it's really powerful. I was rereading some of it recently, and really, that was something else that really, uh, Islam and focus got me into Islam, and then introduction to Islam helped to keep me in Islam. And I lived happily ever after. Alhamdulillah. And hopefully we'll continue to live happily ever after, inshallah. Can you speak about the benefits of giving salawat during Ramadan? Does the Prophet Sallallahu respond to our salawat? How can you offer advice as to how we can incorporate more salawat into our lives? If you want more salawat into your lives, even though I don't like the uh, commercial practices of the company, I like their slogan. So as Nike says, just do it. Just do more salawat. I mean, it's like, do you have any advice how to quit smoking? Take the cigarette out of your mouth, throw it away, take the pack, throw it in the garbage and never smoke again. So sometimes we complicate things and we just have to get on the just to do it plan. Just do more salawat. Now, practically, I would say uh, designate time. It's very important to designate time because you know our time is stolen from us. Facebook will steal your time. LinkedIn will steal your time. Uh, whatever, uh, social media, YouTube, big theft. 
I, I people send me they're like you gotta watch this clip. It explains how COVID nineteen was invented in a lab in China. Yada yada. So, then I'm getting ready to watch it like one hour forty minutes. I'm like, eh, I can't watch this. I don't even have a minute of forty seconds. So I'm looking at for for some three four minute thing and one hour forty minutes. Like this is insane. I can't, I can't do it. And, and so YouTube will to extend your time. And so you watch these three, four minute clips that your friends are sending you. This friend sends you one, that friend sends you one. So you have 20 friends. So they each watch one clip, but now they're each, all 20 are sending that one clip to you. Now you have 20 clips before you. And if you watch them all, there goes an hour and a half of your precious time. And so make a time for salawat. Make a time for salawat. And Ramadan, don't watch television. Don't don't follow YouTube clips. Even if they're about sheikh, so-and-so, recitation, this or that. No, recite your own Quran. It's good to listen to a sheikh, but you have all year to do that. And so to avoid the temptation of just, okay, now this sheikh comes, husari, and then on the side, YouTube gives you Minshawi and, you know, and Fasi, uh, Sudais, Hurvefi, and, and so you're going through all of them. And mashallah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. You're listening to Quran. Uh, but your own tongue, unless you're following along with them, is, is deprived. So may Allah give us tawfiq. Uh, the reward is immense. All of our actions, as we mentioned, the saying of Ibrahim al Nakhai, rahimahullah, one of the teachers, Abi Hanifa, radiallahu anhu, uh, Ibrahim al Nakhai mentioned, Tasbihatun uh, wahidatun fi Ramadan ka alfi tasbihatin fi masiwa. Saying subhanallah once in Ramadan is like saying 1,000 salawat uh, uh, tasbihat. Outside of Ramadan. And so what about the salawat? Which normally the salawat on the Prophet. Man salla alayhi alayya wahida sallallahu alayhi ashura. Kama qal sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoever says one salawat on me. Ya Allah. Peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once Allah extends ten portions of his mercy to that servant. And so, sallallahu alayhi ashura. When Ramadan, that, those 10 are multiplied 70 times over. And so, 700 portions of Allah's mercy in Ramadan. So, I mean, the, the reward is immense for offering the salawat. And then just, just make a time. Otherwise, uh, your time will be stolen. You just, oh, I'm going to make salawat. After Asr. After Asr, <clears throat> you have all of these demands on your time. And you never get to it. So you have to make a time. Muhammad Hamza asks, what are some of the practices you would suggest for ensuring our intellect overcomes our nafs and our hawa? At ta'awwuf. So when you feel uh, the whims of your hawa, aren't you hungry for Burger King now to, to re reuse that example? A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Because a lot of times the, the inspiration that leads to this suggestion is a, is a shaytani. It's a demonic inspiration. So seek, seek the refuge of Allah. Make ta'awudh. Uh, and then make dhikr. And, and, and salawat is a good one to go back to the earlier question. Uh, make salawat on the Prophet. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. And you'll find those uh, inspirations, they become less and less. Uh, another user. MashaAllah. A user. Okay, do you uh, ask, do you have any advice for relaxing activities in Ramadan to give us rest 
and strength for increased worship. Uh, yes, take a nap. <laughs> uh, naps are very good. So it's, it's tough, you know. I, I gave a quote by and I was kind of harsh. I, I kind of regret it. Just saying, just the harshness came and just, it, it was a more of a personal thing, it wasn't universal. I'm just watching a lot of people run off out of the masjid after eight rakats. Where are you going? Go home to watch television or something. But I, I, I shouldn't have been so harsh because some people legitimately have to get up to go to work. It's difficult, you know. And uh, may Allah help and make it easy for everyone. But uh, a nap helps, you know. And during your lunch hour, <laughs> you're not eating lunch. So half an hour, take a take a nap, go somewhere and just rest your, put your head down and rest or as soon as you get off of work. So the average person is getting off, let's say at five, it takes them an hour to get home, so it's six or 6.30. And even though normally that, that's a time when it's makru, it's disliked to take a nap, but under these special circumstances of Ramadan, as soon as you get home, just take a nap. And then you wake up and you have your tar and you're ready for tarawih. So try to get naps in. You know, that's one of the best things. And and throughout the day, vicar, you know, as your job uh, affords you an opportunity, uh, vicar Allah, <clears throat> read your Quran. So if you're not sleepy at your, your lunch break, read your Quran and take the nap when you get home. And, and so that, that will help to open up the pathways for that kind of strength that the Prophet Wasallam was getting. So someone else asked, how do we know where exactly our inspirations are coming from? Uh, you, you consider the nature of them. If, if it's something that's halal and lawful and beneficial, then it's, it's uh, ilahi or rabbani. It's, it's something that's divinely inspired, if, if that's the case. So uh, if it's something haram, it's shaytani. Uh, and then also the maliki, the angelic, is also urging you to do something that's lawful and good. And so generally, generally speaking, just knowing the, the nature of what's being suggested and what you're being inspired towards, that, that will give you an idea of whether it's ilahi uh, or rabbani or it's maliki, nafsani, if, if it's something that might not necessarily be haram, but it's something that you like that's going to turn you or take some, your time and focus away from something that's desired. Uh, for example, uh, taking an unnecessary nap. So you're a little bit drowsy, but you can make it. Uh, but the inspiration, like, go ahead and rest. You know, Imam Zaid said you should take naps. And you didn't finish your, your hizb of Qur'an. And, and so that's something nafsani. And so just seeing where they stack up in terms of there, there being something uh, that is rewarded, uh, uh, lawful, something that's involves a punishment, is unlawful, something that might distract you from something that's uh, rewarding and beneficial and and but and is pleasing to your nafs. So that's one way to identify those uh, inspirations. So Anjor Tripathi asked, should Muslims pursue secular education? You know, I, I don't like I probably used the term somewhere along the line, but I don't particularly like secular education. I think it's better to look at education as as furud uh, ainia or furud al kifaya. So far ain or far kifaya, and so the far ain those are directly religious things, such as prayer. Uh, tahara and prayer, fasting. And so the knowledge of those things is incumbent upon every Muslim. The basics of theology, or aqidah, those things, belief, those things are incumbent on every Muslim, far'ain. 
Fard Kifaya, now you get into medicine. We have to have doctors. That's a Fard Kifaya. A community has to have doctors. And so as opposed to looking at medicine as something that secular education, I think it's healthier to look at it as, as the Fard Kifaya. And so some people have to fulfill that on behalf of the community. And so the same thing, studying these intellectual currents, after you have a strong foundation in Aqidah, that's far kifaya. So I wouldn't say studying postmodernism, especially in its applied uh, application, critical race theory, decolonization theory, feminist theory, queer theory, uh, et cetera. Those things, as opposed to looking at them as secular education, we look at them as far kifaya. Some Muslims have to study that to protect the community from their harm. And so young Muslim comes, I'm confused. You know, I was reading Judith Butler and now I want to disrupt everything, including my own Akita. Some Muslims have to learn that so they can protect the community from the harm of those things. And so as opposed to looking at it as secular education, I prefer to look at it as far, far kifaya. Something some Muslims have to do. We need, some Muslims have to be engineers. You know, some Muslims have to be sanitation engineers. Uh, who's going to keep our water clean? Who's going to help to build and maintain sewage treatment plants so that our, our water waterways don't become open sores? That's a far kifaya because if, if we don't have people who are capable of undertaking those functions, all of the Muslims are going to be harmed. And an environment is going to be created where it becomes very difficult to concentrate on, on one's worship. So I prefer to look at it that way. Allah al-Musta'an. And we seek the help of Allah in all of our affairs. Faithful ask, how do we understand evil impulses in Ramadan when shaitan is chained up? Shaitan is chained up, but your nafs isn't. And I think we mentioned last night, Ada adu we can nafs alati the most uh, dangerous of your enemies is that nafs that resides between your two flanks. So that your nafs isn't chained up. And so the evil impulses that are coming from your nafs. So shaitan is indeed chained up, but your nafs isn't. And that's why it's so important to be serious about uh, Ramadan, because as we fast, deprive ourselves of food, we control our tongue. And because that's where the nafs really expresses itself, we control our tongue. Uh, as we get less sleep, then we're chaining up the nafs and we're, uh, and we're pushing it to higher stages of refinement, where it's more amenable to positive uh, messages and divine messages. Allahumma salli wa rasulillah, A-G-I, uh, S. How do you, uh, do you have advice for Muslims in medicine during Ramadan? I will greatly appreciate any dua for being to carry out my duties during their focus on my exam while fasting. We the sta'anta fasti'in billah. We the sa'anta fasti'in billah. We sta'anta fasti'in billah. Just pray for Allah to give you strength. Pray for Allah to give you strength. And uh, pray for Allah's help. And that's the best thing that you can do. If you ask uh, uh, anything, first and foremost, ask it from Allah. And if you seek assistance in any affair, first and foremost, seek it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, those are the questions. And that's all the time. So it's perfect timing. May Allah bless all of you. We look forward to the final session, two sessions next week, dealing with the uh, farewell, the uh, last part of Ramadan, last 10 days of Ramadan, and then the farewell to Ramadan. So may Allah give everyone success during these days of forgiveness. May Allah bless us to avail ourselves of all of the pathways that lead unto his forgiveness during this month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your worship. May Allah wipe out all of our sins and make us from those liberated from the hellfire during the month of Ramadan. Allahumma barik lana fima baqiya min Ramadan. Waftah lana abu wa barahmatika wa 
ومغفرتك وجودك وسقائك وفضلك يا الله يا الله وحسنك يا الله أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين So uh, may we you know strive in the last 10 days I'll leave you with this uh, there are days uh, to exert ourselves there are days where we're going to be tired of feasibility and our physical fatigue inshallah will open up the pathways for spiritual strength and the price is the price brothers and sisters is tarawi the price is the fasting the price is the qiyam the price is the quran the price is exerting ourselves and it reminds me of the, the qasida the, the things he was talking about in that section the last section of ramadan uh, the qasida was ayyuhal ashikumana husnina so oh, the one who loves to know the meaning of, of the goodness that we possess our dowry is very high for one who seeks to become engaged to us. Bodies that are worn out and souls that are fatigued. And eyelids, some version of the Qasida says, but Jufun is more poetic because it's it's more it's not direct. And so and eyelids that never taste sleep. And so during the last 10 days, the eyelids should rarely taste sleep. They shouldn't taste a lot of sleep. And a heart that has nothing other than us in it. And the us, the, the royal uh Noon. And then the, the, the point And so if you want this and you desire this, pay the price. <laughs> That's the price. May Allah bless us all to pray to pay the price. May Allah Ta'ala bless us all to pay, pay the price and to be able to look at Ramadan and say, yes, we exerted ourselves. Our ideas experience those nights where they taste their very little sleep. Our bodies are worn out. We have to go to work and then tarawi, but that's the price. Yasadun mubna wa ruhun bil'ana. So we're tired. We're not disguising anything. We're tired. But we push through. And then we got that liberatory burst of spiritual energy. Boom. And we said, man, I'm glad I went through that because it was all worth it. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Wa jazakallahu khayran ala sabrikum. Wa husn al-istima'ikum. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum.